The power of God is present in all places, even in the tiniest leaf. God is fully present in the garden, in the field, and in the wilderness like this. Hippie nonsense? Well, try telling that to Martin Luther, who wrote it. And most of us agree with him. 94% of people in the last National Church Life Survey agreed that we can find and meet God in nature because God is present there. And that should come as no surprise. It was out here, according to the Genesis 2 myth, out here in nature, that God formed us. It was out here in the garden from the soil, from the Adamar, that God created the Adam. The earthling from the earth, the human from the humus. The 139th poem in the Hebrew Scriptures imagines us to be created in the secret places, woven together in the depths of earth. Luckily for God, humans hadn't started clear felling yet. Because out here, most of the good Adamar has washed away. Rock hard clay and a bit of dust is all that's left. Coated with a layer of poison to stop vegetation regrowing and to kill off any native animals which might come along and eat the new plantation. According to Genesis 2, God built a beautiful garden and then created us to serve and protect it. We were created for the garden, for the forests and the fields, not the other way round. But back to the forest, to these trees, to the wonderful garden that God left us to care for. Although according to Genesis 2, we wouldn't have to do it all alone. First, the Lord God planted the garden and then put the Adam in it. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what the man would call them. These three verses, and particularly their grammatical tenses, are one of the many clues that this story isn't meant to be taken literally. It's quite at odds with the story and the sequence of events in Genesis 1, despite the attempts of some biblical translations to suggest otherwise. The King James Version, the Revised Standard Version, and Reverend Rebecca Lindsay, who teaches Hebrew at UTC, and a good deal of my own head-scratching over at the Blue Letter Bible website, make clear that in Genesis 2.19, the Lord God goes on to form the other creatures. The New International Version and a couple of others want to claim now the Lord God had formed those creatures. But the tense of the verb they're translating in the Hebrew is wrong. It's the imperfect tense. We can compare it going back to 2.8, when God had formed the man, which is the perfect tense of the verb. The difference between 2.8 and 2.19 shows that while the man had been formed, God was about to go on and form the other creatures. And verse 18 just doesn't fit in the NIV translation. It would be as if God said, Now I will make a helper for Adam, which is the NIV translation, and then suddenly remembers that actually he'd already made all of the other animals and so went and got them for the man to see if any of them would be suitable companions. It just doesn't fit. The clear sequence in the text and in the Hebrew tenses of the verbs is that God says, I will make Adam a helper. God goes on to make the helpers for Adam, but none of them are good enough. So finally God has to make the woman. It's a good story, but it's completely at odds with the sequence in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, God creates all the creatures of the air, and then of the seas, and then of the land, and then finally human beings, male and female. In Genesis 2, God creates the man, and then all the animals, and then the woman. Either Genesis 1 or Genesis 2 aren't a historical record of events. And in fact, the sciences go on to show us that neither of them are. As it turns out, there was no woman who spoke to a snake about fruit in a garden some several thousand years ago. Yet looking around the Clearfell next door to us and at forests all around the world, it's very clear that even if there was no historical fall involving snakes and apples, we are certainly living in the presence of the fall right now. Not just one fall, lots of falls, maybe even you and me. Discarding Genesis 3 as a historical event, of course, has major implications for Paul's theology and his attempts to understand Jesus as the second Adam, who fixed up the mistakes of the first Adam. Although, of course, technically, it was Eve who made the mistake initially. But it doesn't have much implications for Jesus' theology. He wasn't very interested 
in a Genesis 2 fall. He was much more interested in a different fall. As I read him in the Gospels, he's not very interested in the F-A-L-L fall. He's far more interested in the F-O-O-L fall, the one that he warns us about constantly. The fundamental question about the fall is not why or when or how, but who. The guy who hoarded his wealth to keep himself safe and comfortable in the future. The guy who most modern Westerners would call the sensible rich man, not the foolish rich man. Who among us doesn't think that superannuation is a good idea? What idiot would give away their money in the hope that if they are ever in need, somebody would share with them just as they had previously? Jesus seemed to think that we'd all be that stupid, that we would all have faith that God would provide for us through the generosity of the rest of Jesus' followers. Listening to Jesus, you could almost believe that the church in Acts wasn't a bunch of naive communistic morons. He's kind of relentless about it. He goes on and on and on through the Gospels about wealth and its dangers. No one can be my disciples unless they forsake all their possessions. That kind of stuff. The rich bloke who's tormented in Hades because he left poor Lazarus lying at his gate. The judgment of the nations, the sheep and the goats, what you did to the least of me. All that stuff about the rich and the eye of the needle. And no, the needle was not a narrow gate somewhere in Jerusalem that made it fairly difficult for rich people to get through. He was talking about a needle. Remember the sign that Zacchaeus the tax collector had salvation come to his house. And then there's all that woe to you who are rich and woe to you who are full now stuff. It goes on and on. Who wants to deal with that? No wonder we in the affluent West would much rather argue about the F-A-L-L fall, about evolution, about women in ministry, about gay marriage, about just about anything except what Jesus said about wealth and possessions. Feel free to prove me different, but I can't see that Jesus was very interested in the F-A-L-L at all. He's relentless about the other one. Jesus came to save us from the fool from those who are one, from those who aspire to be one, from those who suffer and groan because of all of those out there who have become one. Whether the Genesis 3 fall ever historically happened, these rich fools are leading us to an ecological collapse, an ecological fall, the scale of which has never been seen before on the earth. It's a fall in biodiversity, a fall in equality amongst human beings. A fall in survivability for the poor among us and for future generations. So whatever we make of a historical Genesis fall, we find ourselves living irrefutably amidst the presence of the greatest fall the world has ever seen, and for which many of us are responsible, or if not, at least complicit. Unlike poor even Adam, though, who only got one shot at it, it seems, according to scientists, that perhaps we still do have one decade in which to repent, in which to do something about the rich fools, so that there's just the slightest chance that we might be able to stay in the garden after all and leave it in a state that's fit for future generations to live in and to share with the rest of God's creatures. The rich fools and the rich fool within us all must repent while there is still time left before we all have our very lives demanded of us. Sometimes we just have to leave the tree alone. The power of God is present in all places, even in the tiniest leaf.